Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You are listening to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. Let's get to it. Anthony for three. Everybody. It is Sunday, September 29th, as I record this Sunday night ish. So I've taken a couple days. Um, first of all, I just have to gather my I had to gather my thoughts. Um, I had to gather my thoughts. I had to take all my notes. I had to organize these notes because I have no idea where to start. I had no clue what to talk about. It when something like this happens, you know, as a content creator, it's it's and as somebody who does it basically solo, I have a couple of people help me out, but you know, it's hard to start anywhere. And I'm laying in bed um, a few nights ago. Whenever the hell this happened, I don't. It's all a mush by now. I'm laying in bed. You know, I usually give myself a certain amount of time where I'm allowed to use my phone in bed because I like to, you know, I'll I'll scroll for a few minutes and I'll put it down. And I'm about to put my phone down next to my bedside dresser. And then it buzzes and it buzzes. And it's, it's like two texts from a couple of my buddies. And I'm like, what are they talking about? At friggin' whatever it was at night, 11 at night. And I open it, and it says that Julius Randle, Dante DiVincenzo, and a Detroit for the Detroit first round pick protected, they're all going to the Minnesota Timberwolves, and the Knicks are getting in exchange Carl Anthony Towns. So that's how I found out. A couple of my buddies texted me. I go to Twitter to confirm it. I Google it to double confirm it. And I'm kind of still in disbelief. So I'll give you my first reaction and everything. Um, Wrong page there. I'm going to try to get... I'm going to try to give you all the important stuff. Give you my reaction. I want to pay respects to Julius and Dante. I want to try to get to everything I can't promise I'm going to get to everything that I want to get to because there's so much to unpack here so I'm going to try to cover the important things within however long this episode is going to be maybe an hour maybe it'll be 40 minutes but hello welcome to episode 715 of the podcast I'm your host RJ Carbone you are listening to BD4 where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA, Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. Obviously, we're talking New York Knicks in this. Blockbuster trade, Julius Randle no longer a part of their equation. So in this deal, I'll say it again, Julius Randle goes out, Dante DiVincenzo goes out, and they're also sending out the Detroit first round pick or the the Detroit protected pick for Carl Anthony Towns to come to the garden. 
Now, there's probably also some more coming in this deal because the Knicks have to match salary. There's more money going out than in. For uh, So I think the reports say, from what I was reading, that it's not going to be Deuce McBride. It's not going to be Mitchell Robinson, which was most of our thoughts at the time. That it's probably going to be a sign-in trade with like, some of the non the not essential guys on the roster, some free agents. And I also saw that uh, Charlotte could be involved in this deal. So as soon as that's all confirmed, you know, hopefully it's nothing significant. It doesn't sound like it's going to be. But this is definitely a significant trade. And I want to start, I think it's only right to start off this episode by just saying thank you. Um. Thank you to Julius Randle, first and foremost. Listen, I don't know where to start because I've been a guy as a Knicks fan who has had his ups and downs with Randle. You know, every year it's like you can ask me, do I like Julius? And I'll give you a different answer. But I like to believe that over the last year and a half or so, I've matured as a, as a fan and while he's not been my favorite player, I've I've become someone who's able to appreciate Julius more. Despite all of the ups and downs. Whatever it is that bothered you with Julius, right? The, the lackluster efforts sometimes defensively. The whole thumbs down incident. You know, just arguing with his teammates. You know, the quickly incident. The laptop incident. Whatever it was that bothered you with Julius, at the end of the day, this was the first player to make the Knicks relevant again. Jalen Brunson, for as great as he is and as much better of a player as he is than Julius, he inherited Julius Randle's, or at once it was Julius Randle's team. He inherited that roster. It was Julius Randle who made the Knicks relevant again as that "Quote unquote consolation prize to the was it the 2019 offseason, the KD offseason. They settled for Julius, right? And ironically, he actually ends up being very effective for the Knicks. And Durant was obviously we know what happened there. So, I just want to thank Julius for embodying a total." New Yorker's mentality. This guy was, he loved this city. They just named a court after him. You know, he he was all about this city. He was a guy who took it on. And despite it not always being pretty and, you know, the legacy is kind of in question. At least he's going out at a time where Knicks fans, most of us now, have got his back, right? The whole summer was about, let's get Julius back to health to full health and we're all behind him because he was rolling. The last time we saw him was with the January Knicks when that team was clicking at their peak. So at least he's going out on a note that's positive to a degree. But yeah, this was a guy who endured all the bullshit, man. He had to sit through bad coaches and bad teams at first and just the fan base wasn't totally on his side at first. But I like to believe that there is more peace at the end of Julius's tenure. And I'm, I'm talking like the guy's friggin' passed away. Jesus Christ. Um, but thank you, Julius Randall. I appreciate you very much. And you are a very talented player. Um, and you're going to continue to be a very talented player for the Minnesota Timberwolves. I've got my questions. How the hell is Julius going to play with Rudy Gobert? None of them are spacers. But, like, that's a whole other thing. Thank you. Thank you to Julius Randle for being a great Nick. He's one of the great Knicks of all time. That's not a question. Um, you know, top 15, top 20 Nick. So despite this franchise being an abomination in their in their past, like there have been a lot of good Knicks and Randle's up there. Um Thank you. Thank you to the Big Ragu, man. Dante DiVincenzo comes in here. I love the guy. All my Italian-American fans, we all love this guy. 
fans, all my Italian Americans. We all love this guy. We're big fans of this guy. Loved watching him, man. Loved seeing him come in here, the big ragu, and give Italian Americans a good name in the NBA, and give the Knicks fans a good Italian American. Uh, versus, you know, I think the last Italian they had was Bargnani, which was a, you know. But no, man, Dante DiVincenzo with, you know, comes here on on that contract that he came here as, as, as a um, mid-level exception contract. And to do what he did to, to just put together probably the greatest cup of coffee season for Nick ever. And then in the postseason, of course, listen, he wasn't amazing in the postseason, but he was more of a moments guy. And nobody is ever going to forget what Dante DiVincenzo did game two. I ordered a friggin' shirt of the trans- of the uh, Mike Breen transcript from the end of that game because I was so excited after seeing Dante DiVincenzo knock down that miracle three. We are never going to think about Dante DiVincenzo in anything but a positive way. And the guy, again, was a quiet, reserved guy. You never really heard him you know, show, you never saw him show a ton of personality. But he shut up and he did his damn job. And he hit one of the biggest shots this fan base has seen in such a long time. Got to go back to the 90s. So thank you to him, the Nova Knicks. You know, we never got to see the complete Nova Nick lineup. Never going to get to see it. Um, that's unfortunate. I know he had a podcast with Brunson and Hart. I don't know if that's going to continue. I can't imagine that's going to continue now. But regardless, man, I hope Dante DiVincenzo looks back at his Knicks tenure and appreciates it just like we appreciate him. And I know he will. So best of luck to him, to Julius in Minnesota. And I think that's what that Minnesota deal was mostly about. It was more about Dante DiVincenzo. Um, there, you know, Julius Randle is a guy with upside on an expiring contract. This was mostly about DiVincenzo. But thank you to both of them. And um, I'm going to wish them nothing but the absolute best in the Western Conference. And hey, you never know. These two teams could meet in the NBA Finals this season. But I'm not going to lie, guys. My first reaction when I saw this trade become official, and I, and I when I looked it up on Twitter, and when I looked it up on Google, and I saw, okay, my first reaction, a little bit excited, kind of smiled. Maybe that's just the fan in you. You just, you know, we all like new toys. But like, I'm going to get into some of the benefits of it because I think there are some benefits, man. Some real benefits. Um, and I know a lot of Knicks fans are very, very. And I'm, I'm. If I get traffic on this uh, podcast episode, uh, you know, if I get traffic on YouTube where the video is up, I'm, I'm sure. I'll have some comments who are very much against this trade because, <clears throat> excuse me, because a lot of Knicks fans hate the trade. Um, a lot of Knicks fans are kind of in the middle. I like to believe that I'm in the middle, but more leaning towards <coughs> liking the trade. But if you can remember, if you go back months ago in January, the OG Ananobi trade was also very controversial as well. You know, nobody wanted to see quickly go. People were upset about seeing R.J. Barrett go. That was also very controversial. Give it a few months. That's what I said when that trade happens. Give it a few months. You're going to love it. And what do you know? O.J. Ananobi has become a fan favorite at Madison Square Garden. And I think, I'm not saying that Carl Anthony Towns is going to become that, but I do think people aren't going to be as upset for those who are upset right now when they're watching this Knicks team in the regular season. I, I think give it time and some people won't come around, but there will be some others who start to come around. Um and I'm you know, I'm gonna try my best 
for those of you who don't like the trade, it's going to be hard to convince you, but like stepping into Leon Rose's shoes, I think, and if I look up, if you're watching the video version on YouTube, by the way, if I look up every here and there, it's because I'm watching the Yankees game. It's a meaningless game, but you know, I want to see what happens in the last regular season game. If I were to put myself in the shoes of Leon Rose, it's pretty simple in my opinion what the thought process was. And it was the th- the same thought process they had when they made the OG on an OB trade. It was simply maximizing, maximizing Jalen Brunson. It was making life easier for our franchise captain. Right? And that's the whole idea here. That's what the idea of every organization should be. Maximize your best player's talents. And I think the Knicks might have felt like it was too much Brunson and friends. Like they didn't have... They were just missing. It felt like they needed that one more star punch. And Julius Randle, Carl Anthony Towns, you can argue all you want who's better as an overall player. But I think Towns' name is just bigger around the NBA. You know, I I hate to use this word because people are overusing it now on the internet. The aura is is a lot bigger. There's a rain delay right now. Hey, I'm doing my podcast. Um... Hold on one sec. You want to come in? You want to join? All right. Um, but that's that's one of the reasons, you know. Obviously, center became a massive hole. Um, and I, I just think this is one of my problems for a little bit now. They weren't modern enough. I just don't think the Knicks were modern enough when we're talking basketball-wise. So they went out and they continued to make another high-risk, high-reward move. You know, they potentially raised their ceiling while lowering their floor. They're banking on this to work, and it better. It friggin' better work. And when I mean work, it better get them a championship very soon if not this year. But this is more about the playoffs than it is the regular season, right? Which maybe you see a shift in philosophy. But this was the Knicks pushing all their chips to the middle of the table and telling the Knicks fans they are going for it, which they've been telling Knicks fans they're going for it since last year, right? Trading their best young players and quickly and Barrett for Ananobi. Trading all their picks that they had for Mikal Bridges. Trading Randall and Dante DiVincenzo for Carl Anthony Towns. A lot of people didn't see it happening. It was a rumor forever, but a lot of people never thought it would happen. At the same time, a lot of people didn't see Randall staying a Nick forever. They thought that at some point he was out. And, you know, he was moved. I'm sure there are basketball reasons. He was moved for contract reasons. He turns 30 years old in November. But with the contract situation, he was due for a big payday. At the end of this year, he was due for big money. For a guy who is good, but doesn't play defense needs the ball to be successful, is a mediocre three-point shooter, and is a not the greatest crunch time player. You know, whether it's turnovers, missed shots, we all know about his playoff history. And I think that's the biggest concern. That was the biggest concern, was Julius Randle in the playoffs. How is that going to look against Boston? You know, that's, that's, you know, the defense. Forget about the offense for a second, but the defense as the Yankees are giving up their lead. That's a lot of guys on that ball. Boston's offense is so potent that that is so many guys that Julius has to pay attention to. 
because they were going to force him into multiple actions. You match up with Boston in the postseason, they're going to put Julius into so many different actions. I remember a game earlier last year, or at some point last year, where Frank Vogel was putting him to work, and it looked ugly. Then on the flip side, of course, not a good postseason shooter. You can see that on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. You know, the, the postseason numbers were not very good looking. And Boston is just a team that is so well equipped with wing depth to guard Julius. You know, Derek White, Drew Holiday, they aren't mismatches. Despite Randall being a 6'8 or 6'9, 250-something pound tank, Randall, uh, White and Holiday aren't mismatches. They are not favorable switches. So as soon as he picked up his dribble, that was going to be a problem. They were going to swarm him. I just, it never felt like it was it was going to work. And now you bring in Carl Anthony Towns. Who, again, the interest was there for a while. Just like it was with Ananobi. You heard that for over a year before it actually happened. Same thing with Towns. Long time. And with Isaiah Hartenstein gone... I just, the Knicks just had a gaping hole. They did not trust Mitchell Robinson's durability. They didn't trust him to stay healthy for a full season, yes. But even if you gave, if he gave you, you know, miraculously gave you 70 games this year, I don't think they trusted him to get through four physical best of seven rounds in the NBA postseason. You know, I don't think they trusted him to log. 35 minutes versus Joel Embiid consistently or Giannis and have the conditioning to sustain that for an entire postseason. They were worried about Mitch's durability and rightly so. I mean, he was already out. He's already going to miss time. You know, they're saying maybe late, maybe early January, late December. Like if Mitch went down, which he did, now you have to, you know, the Knicks were trying to sell you that they were going to go small, which we knew that wasn't going to happen. But if they kept this plan with Mitch and they made the postseason again and Mitch is their starting five and he goes down in the postseason game early, well, now you're, you're forced to go to Jericho Sims. Now you're forced to go to Precious Achua. Those are two very undersized fours having to play five against, again, a Joel Embiid. That's simply not tenable. So it was not going to work. You know, you had pre-trade and post-Mitch injury. You had Knicks fans talking about going after Dwight Howard, who's overseas doing some shit. That's how bad the center spot was for them. Iheart was gone. Mitch was down. It just wasn't going to work without a center. Now, there are some Knicks fans worried. We paid a lot of capital and players and we're paying cat a lot of money now for a team under Tom Thibodeau that doesn't really use his bigs like they have a very low usage rate with their big men I would counter simply and just say they haven't really had a scoring big yet under Tom Thibodeau and I know there's history with Tibbs and Cat but I'm not worried about their offense so I want to start with that and talk about the upside that this is going to bring. I really, I am confident in the off, in the offense. I want to talk about the offensive upside. As soon as we return from our first break. Episode 715 of BD4. We'll be right back. Hey there. Thanks for listening in so far. If you enjoy this episode, please give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks so much. You can follow us on social media as well. On Instagram, we're at BD4Pod and at Rob J. Carbone. On X, we're at BD4Pod and at RJCBD4. And on Facebook, we're BD4. Welcome back to the show. Episode 7, not 10, 715. If 
you're watching, that was a little typo there. Episode 715 of the podcast, the Knicks trade Randall and the Big Ragu for Carl Anthony Towns. I am really excited about what this Knicks team could look like in the half court this year, offensively. I think the spacing improvement, that was the very first thing, man. When I told you I was a little excited when I heard the news initially, the very thing I thought of was spacing. That was the first word that came to my mind was space. And to be clear, this only works with Carl Anthony Towns primarily as a five. I'm sure there were going to be there are going to be some lineups where they double up, but this only works with Cat as a five. The whole spacing offense thing, it's going to work with Carl Anthony Towns as your primary center. And the Knicks are going to have lineups out there where are they are consistently, probably all the time, at least going to have a four out offense. And then a lot of times you're going to be able to see them run lineups where they have a complete five out offense out there without Mitchell Randall, without Mitchell Robinson and without Julius Randall. Now, after losing iHeart, there was just not enough spacing with those two guys. You know, Randall was a poor shooter. Mitchell was a non shooter. He was not a threat unless he was dunking the ball or tipping it in off an offensive rebound. They completely ignored Mitchell Robinson when the Knicks were on the offensive side of the ball. Completely ignored him. They would force him to operate in the short pick and roll because they know he's unable to put the ball on the floor and move like that. He was a to- as, as great as Mitchell Robinson was as an offensive rebounder, as a pick and roll roll man, as a shot blocker, as, as a defensive player and drop coverage, as great. You know, the, the defensive hustle and the positioning he put himself... He was he did so many great intangible things. He was also a total liability offensively. And now you're going to be able to put out lineups. Where again, I think their possible starting five is going to be a four-out lineup. It's going to be with Hart in there. So you're going to have Brunson, Hart, OG... Mikal and Cat. I think that's going to be your starting five. That is an elite top three with Brunson, Mikal, and Cat. Those are three guys who are going to score anywhere from 20 to 35 a night. Right? And that just makes it, you put heart in there next to those guys who can all four shoot. He's going to be much more difficult to help off of now. And if you do, He's going to burn you in 4v3 on the back line. Or you're giving him complete access to the glass. And there are are some other reasons that Hart's going to start, in my opinion, which we'll get to in a second. But I think the main reason Tibbs is going to stick with Hart is because he wants his insurance on the glass. He wants his safety valve out there. And with Randall gone, and with Mitch out a while, Tom Thibodeau, and and Iheart, Iheart's also gone. You know, you're removing an interior big from the equation. But now Tom Thibodeau has a spacing big in Towns. But with Hart out there, and a spacing big out there, you still have an incredible offensive rebounder. So Tibbs is now going to be able to keep his identity, keep the team's identity, which is creating those second chances, those extra possessions, which was their MO in 2024. There's still a chance they could do that. You know, you're losing Randall as your your secondary guy to put pressure on the rim, but Hart can also attack the rim very aggressively. So, I think Tibbs is going to have Hart start because he just wants that rebounding in there. And you're still going to see a lot of five-out lineups. I'm hoping he utilizes that strength, right? Like putting Deuce out there 
Overheart. So Brunson, Deuce, OG, Mikal, Cat. I mean, that is talk about five out. That's impossible to guard. That is so impossible to have to defend. That is a matchup advantage every single scenario. You know, you're going to see a lot less gap help with Cat as a five. The the, the Knicks are going to... Oh man, this is like a dream. The Knicks are going to be able to run a pick and pop. An elite pick and pop. Which is, I don't know, if, if you don't know how important that is in today's game, just look at Boston. Look at how they ran their offense with, with the KP pick and pop. With all those Spain pick and roll actions they, they attacked with. Modern NBA... It's trending away where it's more offense over defense, right? Denver didn't have the greatest defense when they won. They were all about their offense. Boston, they had a good defense, but they were all about their offense last year. A stretch five, you know, five out offense, pick and pop offense, that's modern NBA. And Carl Anthony Towns can shoot, and he's also a great screener. He holds the screen before he pops, which is something a lot of bigs don't do well. They just want to get right into the fade. It's going to be so difficult to defend this and get a right matchup. It's going to be really difficult to run ice defense on pick and roll and shade them to the baseline because now you have a five who can pop off the screen and shoot it. It's You can corner space with them. You know, Cat's got a very quick release to beat a closeout, especially if the, if the defender is helping, you know, if he's helping middle from the weak side. You make that skip pass to, to Towns and boom, you're beat. Tibbs likes to use the corners. I think it's going to work, man. I think it's going to work. You know, the small ball was never happening. He was never, the Knicks were never high on having OG and Randall play small ball four and five. You know, that's also why like Dante wasn't going to play. Right, the Mikal Bridges deal to Dante was the Dante deal to quickly. That's what that was. It was the same exact thing. You knew the second that happened, either Deuce or Dante was out the door. And you know, Tibbs is hesitant to go small as it is. So I, I just don't think he was ever gonna. You, you were never gonna see him go small with Ananobi and Randall without Hart. Because, again, he wants Hart out there for rebounding. So that left Dante with a very small role in the team. There were going to be minutes when he didn't play more than 12-15. Games when he didn't play more than 12-15 minutes. So, I can't emphasize enough the spacing. Cat as a spacer, how important that's going to be. As a guy who shoots a lot of his threes above the break at the top of the key, and he's a deep shooter, too. He has some range, so he's going to bring the defense out even further, which makes it more difficult to close out to a deep shooter, which makes it more difficult to bring help and trap. It's going to create even more space for Brunson. If you thought Brunson was elite with league-worst spacing the last year or two, just wait until you see what he's got now. This is going to be a monumental difference. You know, you watch this team last year, and the Nick guards and wings, they had better shooting numbers when iHeart was on the floor versus Mitch last year. And iHeart spaced the floor in a way where, you know, he, he did it with DHO, his floater, but he didn't do it as a shooter. Now you're adding a legitimate spacer, one of the best shooting bigs ever. A guy who can shoot off the catch because he doesn't need the ball. And a guy who can shoot in movement off of curls, off of horns flares, off pin downs. And using Cat as a spacer now versus having Josh Hart, who was often defaulted to that role, where he was above the break right next to Brunson Actions, that's not going to happen anymore. That's going to help Brunson so much. Hart's going to be able to be used as a floater around dunker spots. So, you know, on, on, on drives where Brunson comes off a pick and roll and you have Hart now in the dunker spot versus Mitch, that helper that stunts at the drive is now going to be a wing player versus a big. That's a huge difference. 
I'm sure you're going to see a lot more guard-on-guard screens with Josh Hart as the screener because he's very good when he's used in the short pick-and-roll. And now you're using Hart in a short pick-and-roll with Brunson where Cat's going to be as he'll be the spacer out of it to hit on the kick out. It's just, it's, the offense is going to click. I really, truly believe this offense is going to work as long as they use Towns as a five. And his playmaking's not horrible. Towns can read the floor very well. He can make tough passes to the weak side when the defense helps off. He can make a pass on the move. He can pass when he's on the post. He's a capable ball handler. You saw it in the playoffs a little bit where he can put the ball on the floor. He can attack closeouts effectively with his length. He doesn't need to take multiple dribbles to get to the basket. But you saw in the postseason last year, for spurts, he can occasionally run the five pick and roll as the ball handler. You can get very creative offensively. So I am extremely excited to see the Knicks perform offensive. There will be nights where they blow teams out of the water. They make good defenses look stupid. I truly believe that, and I'm telling you right now that's going to happen. You're going to see nights where the Knicks drop 140-something points on decent defenses. Now, that's the offensive side of it. You know, and I want to talk a little more about the defensive side of it when we return from our break here. Stay with us here on episode 715. We'll be right back. If you're interested in our website, just go to www.bd4blog.com. You can subscribe to our blog on there right on the front page. Just like on the podcast, we cover Yankees, Knicks, and MMA. Also on our website are the links to the different platforms for the podcast. Thanks so much. Welcome back to the show, episode 715 of the podcast. Now, this is where I, you know, go from totally loving the trade to more towards the middle, slightly loving the trade, because the defense, there are going to be some questions here, man. My gosh, are the Knicks going to have to rely on their wings? I don't, and and again, there are going to be lineups where It's not going to be a lot, hopefully not, but where you see Carl Anthony Towns as a four man. And, you know, you can surround Brunson with size, but you still have spacing and shooting. Right? Precious can play four next to Cat as a five. You can run pick and rolls freely still because he's got that shooting ability. I would still be careful with that. Try not to do it too much because I think to maximize. Towns' offense that comes as a five. And getting the best defense from Towns also comes as him as a five. I think he's much more effective guarding fives versus guarding bigger wings and fours. And I hope that Tibbs shows you a lot of those OG Ananobi, Carl and Three Towns lineups. Even when Mitch gets back from his injury, you know, or he doesn't go to Precious or Sims to start games. You know, I just hope we don't see Precious out. Like we're all thinking Hart or Deuce. I hope we don't go out there on October, whatever, 20-something, and it's Precious out there <laughs> because Precious is way too undersized. Yes, he's got athleticism, but that switchability he provides is best when he's at the four. Same with Sims. He's undersized. I think it's going to be important for Tom Thibodeau to find the balance of, of again, his MO, 48 minutes of rim protection. He's got to now find the balance of maintaining rim protection, maintaining that offensive rebounding philosophy while also being able to optimize what he has. And what he has is an incredible shooting team. Optimize that. Can he find the right lineups? Can he push the right buttons? You know, we will see a lot of, again, a lot of three wing lineups because the Knicks want to remain switchable, especially with OG and Mikal out there. Those are your anchors. But, Deuce McBride's going to be getting that DiVincenzo role. 
Dante defensively was best as a gambler when he was off the point of attack. Deuce McBride is more capable at the point of attack. He can navigate screens better. But I think you're going to see a shift. In Oh, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that, gosh, this is where I get nervous. Okay? In terms of the Knicks' defensive scheming. Because Tom Thibodeau's went his entire career being a defensive coach who employs a lot of drop coverage, right? Carl Anthony Towns, I am praying, hoping, all those things that you see less drop coverage with him and more of an aggressive defense where you bring him closer to the level. I'm hoping the Knicks do some more hedging. I'm hoping they do a lot more stunting, showing, recovering, just... Carl Anthony Towns, when he's hedging and stunting, he's become better in that aspect over the last couple of years. And Tibbs, to his credit, did show a willingness last year, especially with iHeart, to go away from a deep drop and play more of a blitz. But Cat is just, he, him as a defender, he's totally ineffective in drop coverage. He's poor at the basket, his positioning's not great. And he's often late to close out. I don't think you can get by defensively. I don't even think you could be an average defense if you're primarily putting Carl Anthony Towns in a deep drop. That's just not going to work. And if that's what the Knicks decide to do, it could get very, very ugly. That's where the lower floor comes into the play. So I think it's going to be important for Tom Thibodeau to employ more hedging. And I, if there's a coach that I trust to figure out defense with his bigs, if there's one coach I trust to do that with, it's this guy right here. Tibbs gets the best of any big he gets. You know, if there's two things I think Tibbs could get with Carl Anthony Towns defending the basket, it's get him to use his length and just be big, be a big man, use your wingspan. And it's going to be also important to have him keep his discipline because Towns has had problems with foul trouble in the past. And a lot of it comes on the offensive end. But there's still a lot of times defensively where he plays way too soft. Way too soft, and he's just fouling out of games in the third quarter. But again, if there's a guy, it's Tibbs because you saw defensive developments from Precious Achua. You saw so much development in in Mitchell Robinson's game staying out of foul trouble over the years. So you might see an improvement on the defensive glass because you didn't get a lot of defensive rebounding from Mitch Randall and Ananobi doesn't give you a lot of that. So I think Cat might be able to help you there a little bit, especially now that he's at the five, hopefully. But defensively, just the primary concern here is is what exactly does he go with, Tibbs? Does he go into a drop or does he play more aggressive? Um, and I guess we can end on this because I don't want to, I don't want to be on here forever. Again, I'm going to try to keep it within an hour. The depth it's crazy because the first half of last year, the biggest strength of this team was the depth, was their second unit. That's kind of gone. You know, it, it was quickly Grimes, Hart, you know, Mitch or I Hart was coming off the bench, and, and now it's now it's a question mark. Now their depth is a giant question. Hart's probably going to go to the starting five. Maybe Tibbs wants him with the second unit as that facilitating spark plug. But even if Deuce starts... Your closing lineup, you know, Hart's going to be in that a lot. He's going to close games. But, yeah, Quickly's in Toronto. Grimes is in Detroit. Hartenstein's in OKC. Mitchell Robinson's out for a couple months. And now your depth is, is you know, you're going to have to choose between a collection of guys after camp, between Marcus Morris and Landry Shamit and Bates and Campaign and, and McBride. Precious Sims and this kid Kolek, who people think he's going to play, but Tibbs is not going to play the kid. Um, but of those guys, you know, Tibbs is still going to run his nine-man rotation. 
It's only going to be nine. So you're only going to see four second unit players consistently. And I would think the guarantees are going to be Precious Achua and Deuce McBride right, if, if Hart starts. And then I would think the last two guys coming out of camp, it could be Morris and Payne because you want another bigger wing in there and you want another guard, right? You want Deuce to play less point guard because Deuce McBride, we talked about this a lot last season. He's more, yes, he's he's got a point guard's body, but he's more of an off-ball wing. He's a, he's a wing, right? He's improved as a point guard, yes. He can penetrate a little bit better. He can give you the occasional pick and roll, you know, the occasional empty side actions, but he's still not a traditional point guard. Deuce McBride is more of a wing than he is a point guard. So I think Payne might make that second unit just because he's more of a guard. But there's a lot of questions with that bench. There are a lot of defensive questions. I'm sure you're going to have to stagger a lot with that bench. You know, if OG Ananobi goes down, and he probably will because he's very injury prone, that could be an issue. So the Knicks might have to look for one more wing at the deadline. But I think in order to prevent injuries, this might be a year where Tibbs has to prioritize the playoffs more as opposed to prioritize prioritizing regular season standings. Make it less about the regular season. Make it more about health for the postseason. Because last year it got ugly, man. And Tibbs took a lot of flack for that. It wasn't always his fault. But the minutes workload might have to, you might have to influence it from the front office. They might have to say something, you know, hey, Tom, we, we really need to focus on, because the Knicks went home last year simply because they were a walking hospital squad. You know? They were a mass unit, man, against the Pacers. The Pacers beat Jalen Brunson and a bunch of randoms. So you look at the NBA landscape and all these teams who are winning titles, it's the healthy teams. The healthiest teams win titles. That's statistically correct when you look at the last couple of seasons, man. Stay healthy. So the bench is a little bit of a question mark for sure. Uh, the Knicks are going to have to make some small trades because they don't have a ton to work with anymore. The capital's all gone, but they have some things they can do. And I think overall you can figure this thing out. So those are my initial thoughts here on this Carl Anthony Towns trade. I, I think overall it could be a positive. I have a lot of worries. I have a lot of things I'm excited for. So I'm sure, again, if I get any comments on this, I have a feeling it's going to be negative ones. People who just hate the trade. Which is weird because like a lot of people wanted Randall Gunn, you know? But I'm giving it time. I'm going to trust Leon Rose. I really think he's doing the right thing here. And we'll let this play out. It could get ugly. You know, Carl Anthony Towns has been known as a soft player. He's got an interesting, uh, you know, personality. But, like, that that could toughen up a little bit with Tom Thibodeau as your coach. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, man. But one of my main things has always been modernizing this offense. And I think the Knicks 1,000% did that with this deal defensively can they still be a good top team I don't know but they are focusing on what wins you games in modern basketball and that's a spacing offense a shooting offense so let's head to our final break and we'll get back and wrap it up with our trivia question stay with us we'll be right with you thanks for listening to BD4 where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis we also do MMA Yanks every series, Knicks every game, and MMA on occasion. Studio 69 Productions is a podcast production agency created by Leo Rodriguez to allow content creators to market their podcast. It's an online platform that will market your podcast or any other project that you're working on. Get in touch with Leo Rodriguez from Studio 69 Productions. You can find Studio 69 Productions on Instagram at Studio69NJ. Studio 69 Productions, where dreams are heard and born. Okay, let's get to our trivia. All right, so our trivia question for episode 715 here. In nine NBA seasons, 
How many times has Carl Anthony Towns been named an All-Star? All right, pretty easy question. In nine NBA seasons, how many times has Carl Anthony Towns been named an All-Star? Folks, that's all I have. I really appreciate you all tuning in. We are 50 minutes into this episode, so we just made it. You know, in our, our, our ideal timeline for this show, I wanted to keep it under an hour, just get most of my thoughts in the important stuff in. So I hope you enjoy the show. Um, and yeah, let me know what you think, because I have a feeling a lot of people, if I get any traffic on this episode, aren't going to like this trade. Uh, that just seems to be a trend. I get a lot of negative comments when I do Nick's episodes. But, um, and I get it. And I'm not, like, I totally get the concern. I, I really get the concern. What I would say to you is just let it play out first. Let it play out. Thank you all. I'll see you in the next show. Um, we have a guest coming up on our next Yankees episode. So stay tuned for that. Later. This episode was brought to you by Anchor. Hey there! If you stayed the entire way through, we thank you immensely for it. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and that you come back for the next episode real soon. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, download these episodes, and share them with your friends as well. BD4 is a five-star podcast simply because of you, and we'd like to keep it that way. Have a wonderful day. Go Yankees, and go Knicks!